whenever you want to start. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Say when. All right. Uh, this is June 25th, 2004, and we are on the top of Little Bear Pen Mountain in uh, Highlands, North Carolina. The veteran we're interviewing today is Rufus Keen Broadaway, and he was born on September 22nd, 1920. The names of the people here are Dr. Broadaway, Myself, I'm Betty S. Banks, and I am affiliated with the, I'm a volunteer for the Atlanta History Museum, and my son, L. Frazier Banks, who is the uh, camera person today. So, Dr. Broadway, you were in which war? World War II. And the branch of service you were in? Parachute Infantry. And your rank? My highest rank was Captain. Okay, and you served in what theater? Uh, the European, European theater. theater, yes. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Um, I was just starting and... Stop it. Okay. Say that again. Okay, you, you enlisted. I, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. This was in the middle of the Great Depression in the 30s. I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go to college. Uh, nobody could really afford that in those days. However, I found myself uh, in a little college just west of Jackson called Mississippi College. Wasn't much of a school at that time, but it has grown to be quite a significant institution. I was a good musician. Um, I joined the band, Mississippi College Band. It happened to be the official band for the Mississippi National Guard. Well, everybody in the band was expected to join, which I did, and uh, once a quarter, once every three months, we dressed up in World War I uniforms and went to band practice, for which we got $12. Now, I could live three weeks on $12. And you played what instrument? I played the trombone at uh -huh. that time, yes. Uh, so that, that was okay. That was in 1938. In the fall of 1940, with the war raging in Europe, and this was uh, uh, more than a year before Pearl Harbor, we rather abruptly uh, found ourselves on active duty. The National Guard mm -hmm. across the country was federalized, so-called. Mm -hmm. And we found ourselves in Camp Blanding, Florida. We were the first troops in there. A camp what? Camp uh, Blanding. B, no, spell B, that. B-L-A-N-D-I-N-G. Okay. Uh, near Gainesville, okay. you know, a little town of Stark, S-T-A-R-K-E. Mm -hmm. And then we found ourselves soldier boys. Well, we, uh, being in the band, uh, we continued to do what we, we played for marching and official uh, uh, events and uh, sometimes uh, serenaded the surrounding countryside, etc. So that's, you asked if I enlisted, yes. That's how I came to be, came to, uh, be in the Army in the first place. Okay. And how did it change after? after you became in the Army, what happened next? Did you go to a training camp or...? Uh, after we'd been there for over a year, uh, in December 7th, 1941, uh, Pearl Harbor was, was bombed. Life suddenly changed for us. 
I had expected to have finished my three-year term of enlistment, uh, but it didn't happen. We were all kept in. And I reasoned that I was a private first class at that time and that we were going to be there for a while and I'd better get busy, which I did. I applied for and was accepted at uh, Officer Candidate School, OCS, at Fort Benning, Georgia, south of Atlanta. Uh, it was a three-month course. At the end of that time, I was commissioned a second lieutenant, infantry. The parachute school was right next door, and the paratroopers looked mighty good to me. All of them moved with such confidence and pleased with what they were, and uh, seemed to be superior beings. So I applied for it and was accepted to the parachute school, and became a paratrooper. I then was assigned to the 507th. Parachute Infantry Regiment. It was a, a fairly new regiment. Uh, the parachute troops were, 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 were new. You know, they were in their infantry, infancy. Uh, so that's that's where I was. What about jumping out of a plane pulled you? I think it was adventure. Uh -huh. Somewhere, I think, we still have the letter from my mother when I wrote and said, I've joined the parachute troops. She really took my hide off if a letter can, letter can do that. However, I was, I was very proud to be there. I had, I had never been inside an airplane. Airplanes weren't very common in those days. I made five parachute jumps before I ever landed on a plane. Was it exhilarating or terrifying? It really was. It really, no, it was not, was not terrifying at all. The, uh, uh, the physical part of it was very demanding, mm -hmm. but uh, jumping out of an airplane was a lot of fun. Now, mind you, uh, it was fun when, when uh, when you had picked a good day uh, under ideal conditions mm -hmm. on which to jump, different at night with somebody shooting at you. Mm -hmm. so. When did you uh, find out that you were going to Europe? Our regiment, the 507th, for some reasons that are not really clear to me, was sent out to be based in Alliance, Nebraska. Alliance, Nebraska. Uh, there was a troop carrier base there, and perhaps that was part of it. Mm -hmm. So we were there for a while. Then in in. Uh, I guess we moved from there toward our staging area to go overseas, and um, we went overseas in December of 1943. Did you know what you were going for? Yeah, we, we assumed that we were going for the invasion of Europe. That was the exception. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, we are. Uh, Seemed to me the 507 was a long time finding a home. <laughs> we were we were based in North Ireland mm -hmm. for a while, and the people there were lovely, a beautiful place, mm -hmm. a little resort town of Port Rush, right on the northern tip of North Ireland. Uh, and that was a, a, a wonderful prelude. For the horrors of war. Mm -hmm. Later on in the spring, we were we were moved over to England, obviously to get read, ready for the invasion. Mm -hmm. Were you jumping all of this time and having more instruction? There were there were training jumps. Mm -hmm. uh, there were um, 
a, a lot of combat maneuvers. Everybody got sharpened up pretty well. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I was assigned to the service company and was platoon leader for the for the riggers section, parachute riggers section. Somebody had to pack the parachutes. Mm -hmm. And my unit, my boys, my soldiers, packed every chute that was used in the invasion by the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Now, we were very confident of our abilities and we reminded the troopers that this parachute came with a guarantee. If it doesn't work, bring it back and we'll give you a new one. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's sort of my call, is <laughs> Nevertheless, we, uh, uh, that was it. Now, in addition, my men, all of us, were also very well trained infantry soldiers. We were trained to be professional killers. And that is a subject that fascinates me to this day. Almost all of us have gr had grown up in, in decent families, taught to be honest, hardworking, uh, gentle, kind. And part of the Deep South culture, as you know, is, mm -hmm. takes that attitude. And then we were taught to kill the enemy. And we became very good at it. What did that do to you inside? And how did you manage it? I assume in this interview we will get to, to the invasion of Normandy itself. But perhaps this is time to say that although there were some skirmishes during that night, early morning of D-Day after daylight, I came around the corner of a barn and ran face to face with a young German soldier. He didn't have his helmet on. His hair was blonde as was mine. Uh, it was as if I were looking at myself. He had a weapon as did I. I raised mine and shot him first. That was the first enemy that I knowingly killed. Um, it did not bother me a lot. That was my mission. Mission of a soldier is to kill the enemy. So your training really came in good stead? It did. Yeah. Any hesitation, then we would not be having this conversation. That's right. That's right. And I imagine that uh, plays a part in your later going on to be a doctor, too. No, if, if, I, I assume we may get into that subject also. I had I'd wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid in high school. Oh, okay. okay. Didn't know how it would happen, but it happened. Okay. Well, <clears throat> you're in, you're, you, 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 let, let me go back. You were in Ireland, and then you got shipped to England. Yes. And then what happened? We began to make more and more intensive preparations for invading Europe. And you um, knew that you were going to invade? That was everybody's assumption. Everybody's assumption, okay. None of us knew where. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, well, the Germans didn't know where. Mm -hmm. There were several feints, F-E-I-N-T-S. Um, But it, it, it wasn't until the night before the, job, the drop that we knew we were going to drop into Normandy. Good yeah. night. What was the food like in, at where you were? Oh, pretty good. Well, I say pretty good. There was, there was plenty of it. It was, uh, it was army, army rations. I vowed when we left England that I never again in my whole life 
would eat mutton <laughs> or Brussels sprouts. <laughs> it so happens that, uh, that today a rack of lamb is among my favorite food, yeah. but in those days it got pretty old. And what did you all do for entertainment? If there were pubs around. The training sounds yes. so intensive. There were pubs, um, an occasional dance oh. sponsored by the British, uh, who, were, who, were, mm -hmm. who were pretty good. Were you married at this point? We were married, oh, yes. When, when were you married? Mary and I were married on July 13th, 1942. So. And next month will be 62 years. Oh my goodness, congratulations. Thank you. W were you were you married in the United States? Or yes. Where were you married? We were married at Marion's home in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. yeah. And where had you met her? <laughs> I, I told you I went to this little Baptist college. Yeah. How she, a genuine Boston Yankee, came to go to Blue Mountain College in Mississippi, a, a Baptist girl's school in North Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I, hey, God sent her, well, obviously. Okay. There's, there's no other no other solution for that. But you were already in Europe in 42. No, no, no. No, no, Have no, I got my no, dates no, no, wrong? No, we, okay. didn't get, we didn't get to Europe until late 43. Oh, all right. Uh, I, I found myself in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, south of Jackson, at a student conference. Uh, I really wasn't interested. I hadn't wanted to be there. And I was leaning back half asleep when I heard someone introduce Miss Marion Dempsey from Blue Mountain, who's going to talk on tithing. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I was interested in. But as soon as I heard this clipped Boston accent, I opened one eye and it loved what it saw. Mm -hmm. I could hardly wait for her to finish so I could get out, find a, a girl or two from, from the same college, from Vermont College, who could introduce us. And what's the expression? The rest is history. The rest is history, yeah. We are still in love. So you were married, though, while you were then playing the trombone in the National Guard, or you were already in the, had been in the Army by that time? Uh, we had not, well, that's right, we, we went on active duty in the fall of 1940. 40, right. So we were married in July of 42. And then were you able to be together? Yes. For how long? Oh, for some time, when we were out in Nebraska, uh -huh. uh, we lived together. I mean, we had a, we had a, uh, an apartment. Uh -huh. um, could live off the base, uh -huh. uh, and we, uh, of course, by the time we got ready to go overseas, Marion went on back to uh, her home and spent the war with her parents. So, so you all were separated for how long? Fifteen months. No, oh, longer than that. From uh, late '43 until I came home in September '45. Oh my goodness! Our first child was born on July 2nd, following D-Day on June 6. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Marion still had not heard from me. Didn't know whether I was dead or alive. Mm. And I first saw our duty when she was 15 months old. My goodness. So but that's, how did you guys handle the separation? How did you stay in touch? Oh, we, we wrote to each other constantly. Mm -hmm. And Marion has collected most of my letters. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had occasion to, we're going to re move from this house soon and had occasion to go through a lot of a lot of stuff mm -hmm. but uh, pulling out these old letters we've spent hours rereading them oh my mm -hmm. as you know there were no 
There were no overseas telephone calls that we could make. Writing correspondence was the only, was the only communication way. we had. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back then. So you, you found out that you were going to land, you were going to invade Normandy. Yes. And what was the feeling in your group at that time? Anticipation. Mm -hmm. We were really tired of getting ready. Mm -hmm. uh, and most all of, all of them, all of my troopers were, were very anxious to, let's get this thing over with. And... Um, we looked forward to it with some anticipation. I, How much warning did you have before you headed out? Well, we were... The day before I had been designated as D-Day. Some troopers had loaded up into planes. I don't believe we did. Mm -hmm. But then we, uh, we, were, we were told that next day I think sometime in the afternoon we had our final briefing and learned that learned that we were going to Normandy. But I don't believe we knew that before. And there was no way you could contact Marion at all? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. okay. No way. Okay. So then what happened? We took off. It was a great air armada. Is this at night? This was at night, uh, shortly after one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Flew south over the Channel Islands, which are west mm -hmm. of the Cotonet Peninsula, the Dormandy Peninsula. Uh, turned east and headed for the peninsula. Now, we received considerable anti-aircraft fire, both from the Channel Islands and when we got over the edge of the, uh, of the Normandy Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there, the plane that I was in was hit. Mm -hmm. And we knew it. I don't believe any of my men were hurt. The pilot called me up presently. I was in, in charge of the ship and said, Lieutenant, the plane is damaged, it's not responding well, I've lost formation, I don't know where I am. And if you're going to get out, you better get out now, because I think I'm going to be over the channel very shortly, the, the British, the English Channel. Well, I thought that was good advice. I didn't want to stay in an airplane that was, <laughs> that was damaged and lost. Didn't know where it was, so we got out. Um, it was the lowest jump I think any of us had ever made. I doubt that it was more than three or four hundred feet. As soon as my parachute opened, I was in a tree, landed in a tree. Well, it's not not a terribly bad landing. Um, it was. I think the moon had just come out. So I was in the shadows. There was nothing going on or in the immediate vicinity. I could hear some small arms fire off in a distance. And uh, what some, some fires looked like burning planes, maybe. Uh, also at a distance, uh, but nothing there. I got down, assembled my gear. Now, we jumped with about 100 pounds of equipment. Mm. So it was a lot to manage. Came around the edge of this, these trees in the shadows and was, was challenged by my platoon sergeant. And it, 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 it so startled me, I couldn't answer. <laughs> and I couldn't remember the countersign for the password. He used his clicker, and I had lost my clicker, like a child's toy. A click, click, clicker. Uh-huh. Uh, like you train a dog? Like you train a dog. Uh-huh. He challenged me the second time, and uh, 
I still hadn't been able to say much. And suddenly he said, you so-and-so, if you don't answer, I'm going to kill you. Well, knowing him, I was surprised he hadn't done so already. So I managed to say my name and his name and, and ask him not to kill me. So that was by, that was. Did he genuinely not recognize you? I, I hadn't said anything so far, and he oh. couldn't see me. Oh, okay. All he knew, I was a figure. Oh, okay. So that was the start of it. For the rest of the <laughs> night, we accumulated maybe six or eight guys. Uh, some of them my men, some of them not. We had, we had dropped very much out of our designated drop zone. How, how many men dropped? There were 50 in my plane. 50 in your plane? And they only uh, found six of you? Yes. Um, no, there were 25 in my plane, mm -hmm. half, half my platoon. I landed inland of Utah Beach, not bloody Omaha, mm -hmm. Utah Beach, mm -hmm. north of Omaha Beach and about a mile and a half in from the, uh, from the coast, from the channel. So you were inside the German lines then? Oh, well, everybody was inside the German lines. There were no German lines. Oh. We, were, we were back of the defenders of the coast. Now, the 507th was supposed to jump much to the west of that, west of the Murder Ray River. We were well east of the Murder Ray. Spell, spell that word for me. M E R D E R E T. Okay. Murder Ray right. River. It ran, ran to the south. Um, the Germans had flooded. They had, they had some dams that they could control. They had flooded all of that area, much of the area, west of the Murder Ray River. And a lot of paratroopers landed in the water, and many of them drowned right then and there. So chances are, if the plane had not been hit and my pilot hadn't been able to drop us on the designated drop zone, that uh, I had a good chance of being drowned. When they flooded it, it flooded it deep? Uh, some of it was over the guy's heads, yeah. And when you're loaded down with equipment, your parachute comes down over you. Uh, it's pretty difficult to survive. And many of them, many of them did not. So how many did you all get all together? Well, by daylight there might have been uh, ten or twelve of us. We had, we had had a, a couple of skirmishes, uh, some shots fired back and forth, a few grenades thrown. I'm not sure that we, uh, that we really did much before daylight. Uh, you see, the we were disorganized because having you know, that, that the drop itself was a disaster because not many troops dropped on their anticipated drop zone. But turn it over. What about the Germans? There were, there were paratroopers all over that peninsula. Mm -hmm. They didn't know where we, the enemy, were. Mm -hmm. And reports kept coming in from telephones, etc., that uh, the paratroopers here and paratroopers there, paratroopers. they didn't know how many or where we were or who we were mm -hmm. or anything else. So it was, uh, that was quite, uh, quite an interesting situation. And then during the next day, I found myself fighting with elements of the 101st Airborne. See, by that time we were we were 82nd Airborne Division. Mm -hmm. The 101st, the, that was their area where we we had dropped. And then the following day, I had maybe 40 men from my unit from the from the 507th, and we went back cross country towards San Mariglis, which was the spell town. that one for us. The French spell it S-T-E, period. M-E-R-E, mm E-G-L-I-S-E, -hmm. e -E, mm -hmm. San Mariglis. 
That, if you remember the stories, was where the paratrooper got hung up on the church steeple. His parachute caught. <laughs> and he hung there while the battle raged below, uh, hoping that nobody would notice that he was still alive. <laughs> and today, if you visit St. Mary of Lees, there is a replica of Private Murphy, I think his name was, hanging from his parachute, which is caught on the steeple of the, ch of the church. And did he get out alive? He got out alive. <clears throat> to continue, finally we hooked up with a fair number of troops from the 507th and found ourselves at the east side of a causeway across the river. Now, the Murderay River wasn't much. It might have been, uh, let's see, 50, 60 feet wide. It was not a, not a big river, but all of that area was flooded. Uh, there was a causeway, the Lafayette Causeway, spelled L-A-F-I-E-R-E, -E, Causeway. And that's how the sign reads today, and I suppose that's the way it read there. That causeway had changed hands a couple of times. Uh, I guess uh, members of the 507th had taken it initially, the Germans retook it, uh, and that had, at that point the Germans held it and it was pretty heavily fortified. And it was essential because? It was essential because this, this led the way across the peninsula so that then the American troops could turn south and uh, they were coming in from the beaches so they had to get across the Murder Ray River. And this was one of the well, two essential ones at the time. Mm -hmm. The other one was a few miles south at Chef de Pont, C H E F D U P O N T. There was a a a, a manor house uh, just at this side of the causeway, and we were behind that. And the orders were to retake that causeway. And it was one of the bloody actions of World War II. 10 o'clock in the morning, there was some artillery to support us, an artillery barrage initially. Then we went swinging in direction across that causeway. Causeway had burned out vehicles bodies, uh, injured, injured men, a few people who were so terrified they couldn't move forward or backward. Uh, there was machine gun fire coming in from every angle, small arms fire, mortar fire, uh, artillery fire, uh, everything you could think of. And yet, somehow, we kept we kept moving. My sergeant and I were, were picking up guys saying, come on, get out of here, you're going to die here, let's move ahead, and firing as we went, and somehow we got across and, and took that causeway. Mm -hmm. It was just a... Uh, the war began to take on a new dimension for me. I was, I can't remember why, but with a small group of men, I presume I had been told to do this. As soon as we got across the causeway, there was a dirt road to the left. We went down a hundred yards or so, and there was a, a, a German mortar emplacement up on the side of, it was a sunken road. Well, they threw some grenades over, we threw some grenades back. They started yelling and screaming because they were hit. There was a, there was a new lieutenant, 
who had joined us just before the drop, whom I didn't really know. He and I, side by side, stuck our heads up to see what it was we had hit. And he fell back into my arms, shot right through the crossbar on his helmet. And I think it was then that the war, the war became very serious to me. It no longer was cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians. This was, this was a deadly business and affirmed again that you've got to kill the enemy. This is what war is all about. We were there for, I believe, two, two and a half weeks. Then they began pulling the paratroopers out because there were other missions for the airborne. We were taken back to England. I found myself assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division Parachute Training School in England. To this moment, I don't know how that came to be, mm -hmm. why I was selected or appointed. Were you to train others? Train others, yes. Mm -hmm. I was the chief physical instructor. Uh -huh. uh, we had to get these guys ready very quickly, mm -hmm. and it was a demanding job uh, and it was a demanding course that we had. Had you received uh, any of your awards from the taking that causeway? Let me let me put it this way. Uh -huh. My company commander was Captain Robert Ray, R A E, mm -hmm. a wonderful man. Uh, very recently, last month. This is the year 2004. Last month in Atlanta, there was a convention of the remaining veterans of the 507th, and Captain Ray, who, who now deceased, um, was very much honored in that. He was my company commander. Mm -hmm. Captain Ray and I were shoulder to shoulder through that crossing of the causeway. Mm -hmm. Captain Ray got a Distinguished Service Cross, second only to the Medal of Honor, which he very much deserved. Mm -hmm. I got the satisfaction of knowing that I had got to cross the causeway. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're now in England. Uh, I was at the, at, the, at the parachute school. General Gavin, James Gavin, G-A-V-I-N. He was a brigadier general at the time. He was assistant division commander for the 82nd Airborne Division. He was in charge of plans and training. And he was up at the, up at the jump school, oh, a couple, three times a week. I can't remember, although we might, he might have addressed me personally, I can't remember that. However, one day the camp commandant sent for me. Uh, I knew him. He was a, f a friend, a major. That was the first lieutenant. He said, uh, Lieutenant, what have you screwed up now? I'm using a euphemism, of course. It was a more common term for screwing up. And I said, Sir, he said, what have you done? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you must have done something awful. He said, I have received uh, instructions to send you to meet General, uh, to see General Gavin at division headquarters in Leicester. I said, what, what on earth is this all about? He said, I honestly don't know. But you got a Jeep and a driver, you better get yourself cleaned up and get over there which I did, reported into General Gavin, who said that uh, the, the 18th Airborne Corps was just being formed, and General Matthew Ridgway 
who had the 82nd, was being promoted to command the Corps, and that he, General Gavin, would get the command of the 82nd Airborne Division, and that he would be entitled to a second aide, and he wanted me to come on as his junior aide de camp. Mm. How and why that happened, I have no idea. Mm. Just no idea. But it was a heady experience. General Gavin was an extraordinarily fine person. Perfect gentleman. Uh, well read, well educated. I never heard him say a demeaning word. He didn't use profanity, he didn't curse. Um, soft spoken and a, a role model if I've ever had one. That was that was my general. What did you do for him? Or with him? Practically everything. I he had a so called Batman who took care of his clothing and shoes and I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't shine his shoes, no. Mm -hmm. Um it was my job to get up first every morning, get over to the situation room, mm -hmm. see what had happened during the night. Uh, when we were in combat, I was at his side constantly. Mm -hmm. um, I think both to uh, reinforce his presence, you know, in case, and we frequently got into small arms fire. Mm -hmm. um, but I was with him. Uh, to do everything all the time. I um, in in the midst of September, we invaded Holland on the Market Garden misadventure, as it turned out. This, this was this was what year? Oh, this was in. Uh, this was still in 1944, 44, September 1944, Aide de Camp. Jumped in the same plane with General Gavin. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of a sunny Sunday afternoon, just south of my Megan. Can you spell that one? N-I-J-M-E-G-E-N, my Megan, mm -hmm. a prominent city. Um, on the eastern side, of, I guess about the midpoint of Holland, and a very few miles from the German border, there's a point of, of Germany that comes in there that, that is very close. We had, we, Marion and I, had become acquainted with a, uh, with a Dutch priest. He had, he had founded the Airborne Museum south of Nijmegen and had, had attempted to contact as many people as he could and he wrote to us and we later on we visited him in Holland. He tells the story, he was a 13 year old boy. On that Sunday afternoon he heard a noise and he, he didn't he didn't know what the noise was, sort of a roar which, which got louder and louder, and presently the air was full of airplanes. Now, he had seen very few airplanes in his life. I mean, airplanes were not common at that time. He climbed to the top of his father's barn and watched an army drop out of the sky. Imagine, so imagine that. Yeah. So there we were. Yeah. Um, the Holland mission came to be a disaster. It had been uh, it had been pushed by General Montgomery, the British commander, who was very unpopular, not only with the American troops but with the British as themselves. Um, the 504th Regiment, Third Battalion made the assault across across the Wall River, which was the river that came through Nijmegen. There were two bridges, <coughs> a railroad bridge and, a, and, a, and an automobile bridge. 
that had to be taken. And the only way to do it was to make an assault across the river in small canvas boats. I don't know whether the cameraman can see, but this picture, this picture is a drawing, a painting of the crossing of the Wall River by the 3rd Battalion, 504th. Uh, a bloody, bloody thing. But by George, they got across, seized the other end of the bridges, and we had those bridges secure. There were British tanks lining the streets of Mount Megan. The British 1st Airborne Division was at Arnhem, A-R-N-H-E-I-M, uh, 14, 16 miles up the line, being cut to pieces. And General Montgomery would not let us go up and rescue them. One of my fellow officers accosted the first British tank that came across the bridge and stopped. And he said, come on, let's go to Arnhem. He said, no, I don't have orders to go. <laughs> My fellow officer pulled out a pistol and said, <laughs> he was dissuaded from shooting him, but that was, the, that was the sentiment at that time. We've done all this, we've got this far, we've made this effort, mm -hmm. we've lost our buddies uh, trying to help. We want to go rescue those fellows at Arnhem, and we were not allowed to do so. So Do the, you believe today, looking back, that you could have? Oh, it was pretty iffy. There was only one road. Uh -huh. The Germans had a lot of tanks in the vicinity. Uh, I, I happen to think that the 82nd Airborne could have done that. Uh -huh. But nevertheless, that's the way that turned out. Uh -huh. The Holland then settled down into a defensive uh, posture uh, for a while and then we finally were sent back to France to be in reserve. And the next thing is the Battle of the Bulge whenever you're ready for it. Okay. So, and this is hold, the... Uh, hold, hold. I need to change tapes. Okay. All right.